I'd like to introduce to you our first speaker today, Francisco Dominguez. Francisco is the head of the research group on Latin America at Middlesex University. He is the national secretary of the Venezuela Solidarity Campaign and co-author of the book, Right Wing Politics in the New Latin America. Francisco has just returned from Venezuela where he was able to accompany the Venezuelan people in their elections and see the process firsthand. Francisco, can you tell us what you saw and experienced during the elections in Venezuela? Sure, thank you for organizing this, it's quite timely. And the idea of making a comparison, a contrast between what happened to Nicaragua and Venezuela is very appropriate. I think, you know, people will draw good conclusions after this and we hope to do a good job. I was invited to be an observer. I think they call them veedores, which is somebody who is going to watch rather than observe. The reason why there is a difference between watching and observing is because observing is when there is a team that has been organized internationally for some reason that the elections in any particular country are not to be relied upon. So there is observation when there is this problem. The Venezuelan system is the best in the world. It's been characterized by, as done by none other than Jimmy Carter himself. And so therefore I was there. We arrived there on the 23rd. We did several meetings. They gave us information, inducted us as to what we were supposed to be doing, where we were going to be going and so, yeah, and so on. And it was totally peaceful. There was absolutely no problem on the 23rd, 24th, 25th, all the way to the 28th. On the 28th itself, the election took place without any major complication. We visited several, you know, a group of us visited several centers. The amount of people that turned up was huge, but much more than normal. In fact, the information we have now from the National Electoral Council, the CNE in Spanish acronym, uh, is in the region of 61, 62% compared to the election on 2018, where the turnout was 41 because the opposition boycotted the election, did not participate. So you can imagine, you have a situation where there is no complication whatsoever, no problem at all. And the difficulty was that in the evening, there was a delay in the information being given to the population, to the public, to the voters. Normally, given that the system is totally computerized, the results are more or less in two, three hours after the uh, polling stations closed. In this case, it was taking longer and longer. I would say it would take, it possibly took something like two to three hours longer than normal. So we got the first information by 23.30, 11.30 p.m. And the information was on the first bulletin from the CNE where Maduro, President Maduro had won by 52% against 44% of Edmundo Gonzalez followed by various others. Almost immediately, literally 30 seconds after, but we were watching television in various places. No, no sooner President Maduro announced that this was the case, you know, sorry, no, no sooner the CNE announced the results that 30 seconds later in a television network of the right wing, uh, there was Maria Corina Machado who made the statement, not necessarily Edmundo Gonzalez, the right wing, extreme right wing candidate, who said that they have won, they have 100% of the uh, of the documents signed for every single voting place, and that they that they have won by 70%. The Maduro had got only 30%, and they said they would not recognize the results. So that created the context. Um, immediately on that night, before any violence. I'm not aware there was any violence on the evening. There was a huge march going to the presidential palace by, you know, the Chavista people with thousands and thousands and thousands of them. We saw them walking by, um, going towards the presidential palace to celebrate. And we saw the images on television who were extremely happy, very relaxed. And they were dancing, shouting, screaming, you know, when you as when you celebrate the thing. Now, next day, there was pandemonium. But before I get into the pandemonium, I want to give some context as to how and 
what was the contest where this took place? First of all, number one, I think what we are facing in the case of Venezuela on this particular occasion is a coup d'etat of a new type. And this involved the following components. Number one, I was very surprised. In fact, I was shocked by the level of homogeneity of all, I, I don't want to exaggerate, all the corporate media in the world. I speak several languages. I check so many newspapers to see whether there was any anywhere in the world that was not part of the mainstream media that was not telling the same story. This was a massive campaign of bombardment, a media campaign of bombardment, which was directly directed towards the people of Venezuela, which was extremely nasty. It was really nasty, it was really intense, it was really toxic, and it was 24-7. This lasted several months. Now, there is only one center in the world, as far as I'm aware, that has the ability and the power to really command that level of obedience by the whole of the international media. And I think that is in Washington. So this is a very important component. This was supplemented by a really nasty, I don't know how many, but millions of messages of hatred, very intense, intense hatred being spewed through all sorts of mechanisms, through cell phones, um, you know, social media, social network, and so on, which was really bombarding the population literally all the time. And the key messages of the mainstream media was the following. The elections are rigged, Maduro is going to lose, but if he wins, then there is going to be a massive exodus of Venezuelans leaving the country, which is going to be much, much bigger than the one that left before. They even quoted polls, would you believe it? Quoted polls, which obviously are totally fake, that they reckon that 40% of the population would leave the country if President Maduro won. 40% of the population in Venezuela is about 12 to 13 million. This is was insane, but you can imagine the pain that the population went through with the sanctions and with the exodus that did take place, they, they encouraged themselves. You know, imagine the shock, the impact, the pain, the anxiety that this produced in them. So that was the second part. All the period before the election, there were discrete but loads of information about terrorist attacks. Many of the terrorist attacks, particularly in the eastern, in the border with Colombia, but not exclusively, there were many terrorist attacks, particularly targeting the electric system. They targeted, you know, food uh, storage facilities. They also targeted several uh, headquarters of the PSUVE, the Socialist Party of Venezuela. Um, and they attacked several other places, but mainly the main concentration was there. And only something like two days before election day, Freddy Bernal, who is the governor of the state of Táchira, in the border with Colombia, showed on television the arrest of six individuals, two of them Colombian paramilitaries, four of them Venezuelans, who actually were intending to blow up a massive electricity facility in that state which was going to live without electricity about between four to five states. And he showed the cylinders that they had, plus several other weaponry. And he calculated that the explosions of those cylinders, which was the intention, was equivalent to 750 kilograms of TNT. You can imagine the intention of that. So the whole basis of the whole preparation of it, of this coup d'etat, was actually to ensure that the CNE digital system could not be work, could not work, could not produce the results. Then there was, there are plenty of information from the vice president, for the president, for several ministers, the president of the National Assembly and a few others, members of the PSUV, saying that the CNE system, the digital system, the electronic system was subjected to massive cybernetic attack from North Macedonia. You know, I was surprised at why, why Macedonia, but anyway, any other place where you cannot see the real hand behind it. And the whole idea of this, I, you know, I don't have technological knowledge that good, 
to be able to explain it better. But what it was is that the CNE system, the CNE digital system that calculates, totalizes the system as the information is coming in, has something like 15 firewalls. So the cybernetic attack intended to destroy one by one of these firewalls. Um, so therefore, until they got to the end of it, to the core of it, which they intend to destroy. So what happened was technicians, the experts, you know, of the CNE were constantly trying to repair the firewall. And when you repair the firewall, it takes time, but also you have to reset the system. These were the reason for the delay. So I think to be, to begin to draw some conclusions, I think the intention was to destroy the CNE system so that there was no results given whatsoever. In the absence of those results, given that they prepare these riots, these warimba, as they call them in Venezuela, they intended to launch it, and this was part and parcel of the coup d'etat. The violence was terrible. I remember, um, I was in one of the hotels, and suddenly our hotel was surrounded by about 400 thugs. And they came, you could see that they really wanted to do damage. I don't think they realized we were there. Otherwise, I think we'll be telling a different story. Uh, they surrounded the hotel, but didn't intend to come in. They saw a couple of National Guard officers there who they attacked, they brutalized them, brutal horribly. We saw all of us from our windows, and then they took one of the motorbikes of one of the National Guard officers and they set it on fire right there and then. So when we began to get the information about what was going on in many other places, it was, the, it was a complete national in many cities they went for it. I cannot go into every detail, but they, did damage to 12 universities. They tried to set on fire hospitals. They went for crashes with people and children inside. They attacked something like 3,600 members of the PSUV or people that they thought they were members of it. They went on the rampage. They attacked, attacked 30 ambulances, you know, very reminiscent, reminiscent of what happened in Nicaragua. So because they couldn't do it, because they couldn't prevent the result from coming out, then the actual Warimba, the actual riot, lost um, steam. Um, I don't have all the details, but my sense is that the riots lasted for about four hours. They didn't last for more. The information we have is that about 60 to 70% of those who were arrested participating in the riots were very young. Many of them came from the United States and from Chile, people who had, you know, left Venezuela in the past, that none of them voted. They were asked specifically after they were interrogated whether they voted. They said none of them voted. They were told they were paid something like four, between $40 to $150 to do this. And what is interesting of the whole thing is that in order for them to get paid, I understand, they have to take a selfie of themselves doing the damage. Otherwise, they don't get the money. And in order to ensure they're enthusiastic enough, they were given, as they've done before in 2014, in the, in the riots then, that lasted three months, and in the riots in 2017, that lasted more or less six months as well, they were given a drug, which is, which is normally used by mercenaries in order to focus, focus their attention. This is the, the actual information. So what happened was they went on the rampage and they caused a lot of damage. Now just to, uh, perhaps we can discuss this later on because I don't want to make it too long, but what happened was that President Maduro went to the Supreme Court to start with, and then requested that the Supreme Court investigated the, the whole electoral process. And the Supreme Court was receptive of this proposal where President Maduro and the CNE promised, and they have done it already, Go, going to submit 100% of the documentation of all the voting places. Um, as soon as, no sooner, the Supreme Court accepted this investigation and the Supreme Court called upon all the candidates to submit all the evidence that they had, no sooner this was accepted, 
that three minutes later, Anthony Blinken, Blinken actually declared uh, his recognition of Amundo Gonzalez as the elected president of Venezuela. That is to say, Blinken and the State Department, who were behind the coup d'etat, tried to stop this very smart initiative, which was legal, totally constitutional, by President Maduro. So now what we have is the United States, in the last two days, suddenly, through a spokesperson from the White House, backtracked on the recognition. The guy in a very convoluted statement said more or less something like, well, you know, we are, we haven't got all the evidence, we haven't got all the information, and we're not in a position yet to, uh, to uh, extend the reach of this recognition, which was followed, surprisingly, almost hours later, by Argentina. Argentina also backtracked. It had recognized the Mundo Gonzalez, and now it didn't. So that is still pending. Um, Maria Corina Machado and Raimundo Gonzalez, they said that they are going to engage in a, what they call a strategic pause of their action. Um, the Attorney General of the Venezuela is instigated the criminal investigation into their activity, which is subversion, usurpation of functions, uh, declaring themselves winners and so on. And what the Attorney General said, we're not going for arrest for now. That was made very, very, very clear. So the position is now that apparently Brazil, Mexico, and Colombia seems to be a sort of bridge uh, between the United States and the Biden administration and the Venezuelan government. And I think the Venezuelan government, by having taken a very firm line not to make any concessions of any kind whatsoever because they won, and they won clean. Um, this has really firmed up just about everybody else in the, and has for the United States to backtrack. So not only they score a very important victory against uh, the right wing against against the right wing again, but also they defeated a fascist coup d'etat who has been terrible. So our responsibility, and I hope to be able to say more on this, um, our responsibility is to ensure that we redouble our our solidarity with Venezuela, but also draw the conclusion: the, if this could be done to Venezuela. There is no reason why these tools and weapons and um, powerful mechanisms that the United States has cannot be deployed and used ferociously against any other country. I leave there and you know wait for questions. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Francisco. Really appreciate sh you sharing your experiences with us. It's so important in knowing how to respond to questions and um, being able to say, we've heard firsthand um, what what is actually happening there. Um, if that's okay, I think I'll give some more details of the system as well as the observed because, you know, the media is so insidious that we need to really go through details of this. Um, the role of the observers or be veedores or watchers or accompaniers, there are several categories and we have different protocols and that's quite important. For example, the accompaniers can make political statements, you know, when they meet, when they go around the place and if they want to see uh, um, polling stations, they can. Whereas people like myself, a bit old, we couldn't make any statement. We were totally impartial in that sense, whatever we had in our head. Um, the system is organized in such a way that somebody comes in with an identity card, the number is uh, typed into a special machine, and then after it's typed in the special machine, the photograph of the person comes up in the machine itself. That confirms that the person is the person. But then the, there is the capta huella, which is the fingerprint machine, where the person has to put the fingerprint, you know, the thumb, and then that confirms that the person is the person, and then that activates the voting machine. The person goes to behind the sort of very simple thing covered. The person makes a choice with the finger, it's a touch screen, and then the screen produces their preference, and then they ask them to confirm that that is their option. When they say yes, they go, the vote goes in electronically, and then a receipt is produced by the machine, which is getting by the voter, and they confirm in a printed version that they voted for what they really voted. Then this goes into a box. 
the person continues to go to another couple of offices that actually have a list which is in paper and they find the name of the person on the basis of their identity card, they have to sign that and have to put the fingerprint on that. That is the end of it. That is to say, it is impossible, literally impossible to you know, substitute somebody. That's number one. So we observe the process, we ask the people and so on. Number two, all the parties are entitled to have the witnesses present in every single voting place, absolutely all of them. And there were 30, over 30,000 of them. At the end of the process, at six o'clock or round about there, if there is nobody in the queue, then the machine electronically produces the result. This is tallied with what is in the box. Once that is the case, then all everybody, including the witnesses, signed an acta, which is the document that has a QR. So the confirmation of that goes electronically into the National Electoral Council. And a copy of that with the QR is given to every single party representative who they send this to their own centers of totalization. So if every single body has every single actor, I don't know how many there are, but it's thousands and thousands and thousands of them. And nobody knows exactly what is going to happen at the end because it is one single place and every single place has something like 400 to 900 to 1200 person who actually vote. And not everybody votes in that you know, election. So it is literally impossible. So my point, the first point I want to make is this. If Maria Corina Machado and Edmundo Gonzalez claim they had 100% of the actors, there is no reason why they couldn't submit them and they're hiding. And it's totally clear that they don't. Because if you won by that margin, which is nearly 40% on top of what Maduro is supposed to have got, then you know, there is no reason for that to deny, to, to sort of hide away, to play games, to play cat and mouse saying they're not there and so on. What you would do is to actually produce the evidence, the New York Times will produce it, the BBC, the US government and everybody else, and we haven't got a single real actor from the position that confirms anything. So that's important. In other words, the system is completely impeccable. It's totally impeccable. Before the election, there are at least 15 audits and the system is such that you cannot move to audit number one to audit number two until audit number one is satisfied, everybody's satisfied with. Then you move to number two and in every single audit, everybody participates. All the political parties that are involved, including independents, technicians, international personalities, experts and so on participate in this. So you get to the election only after 15 and the final audit is the one that I'm telling you about, which is they tally what the uh, machine, the electronic machine produced with the box of the, uh, of, the, of, the box, of the ballot box. So our job is totally simple. We go there, we check that everything's going okay. I remember, you know, shaking hands with members of the PSUV, with members of the opposition, with members of Maria Corina Machado party saying, well, it's great that you're doing this job. Thank you very much for allowing us to be here and so on. So that's number one. It is very important to understand this. But when they say in the media that Maduro and company and the government and the CNE are not prepared to submit the document, this is totally false. It's completely false. It's not true. You can't really you know, it's fault, it's fraud proof, the whole system. So that's number one. Can I answer some of the questions? Shall I leave it here? Leave it there for now and we'll and and we'll see. Yeah. If there is anything that need, people need to clarify regarding the election itself, you know, I'm quite quite happy to, to go, come back. So I leave it there for the time. That's fine. Um there there is another question uh, in the in the Q and A about um, who has allegedly paid the rioters. I don't know if Camila knows the answer to that, or uh, or if Francisco can speak to that. Who is who is actually paying the folks who are out uh, creating the violence? Go ahead, Francisco, if you can. Yeah. Um, in two thousand and fourteen. It was clear, and the reason why we know this is this. When somebody who is participating in riots, normally very young people, usually people with some criminal record of different kinds, because, you know, they go for that. They are interrogated, they're arrested, they're interrogated. 
a drug test is actually conducted on them to, to know whether they've been on the drug. So every single one of them has this test that is conducted on them. And that's what we know that on this occasion and previous occasion, 2014, 2017, they use Captagon. And they themselves, and there are plenty of videos all over the place, where they say, I was offered 20, 40, 150, $100 and so to do this. And the complication, and they, they themselves explain after they've been arrested and they come down after the effect of the went away, they said that <laughs> they have to actually take a picture of themselves doing this stuff or else they, have, they are not paid. And the money comes from the money stolen to Venezuela in the United States, which is disgusting. So that's the problem. So they have millions and millions and millions of dollars to do whatever they want. And that is what, and there is, a, there is a sort of pattern that took place in 2014 and 2017. In the first case, it lasted about three months. And in the second case, it lasted about six months. I think they were prepared for something longer this time, but the robust response from the government it was sufficient for them not to continue. How do you regard the success with which Venezuela and Nicaragua have been have been able to defend their sovereignty uh, and uh, against uh, repeated uh, interventions from the U.S.? Well, I think it's extraordinary. I think the response of the FSLN and the Sandinista people has been very robust, so robust that actually um, sometimes it creates problems in solidarity work because the people over here think it's too robust. But I think it's exactly the right thing to do because a little country, which is so small, but is so proud and is so fantastic that it's sort of changed, you know, the perception of Latin America, certainly in 1979, and it's been brutalized, waged war against 50,000, 80,000 people have been assassinated and so on and so forth. They deserve to defend themselves with everything they have. So, you know, I take my hat off of the Sandinista people of the Venezuela, of the Nicaraguan people for their ability to defend themselves. And if you look at, I don't have the time, I'll just give the, the headline. If you look at the economic successes of such a poor country in terms of being able to cater for their own population, it's just incredibly amazing. It's even, as we say in London, it's even better you know, much, much better. So it's fantastic in every possible sense. Now, in terms of Venezuela, I think it's sort of perhaps in interesting in the following sense. The amount of sanctions that were inflicted on Venezuela has been 930. It's huge. I mean, there was a moment when a country which depended almost totally from the oil revenues lost 99% of that. That is to say, there was one point in 2015, 14, when they were receiving, say, the equivalent of $100. And then two years later, they were receiving one. And they were able to survive, not only to survive, not only to improve the self-sufficiency, not only to defeat imperialism, but also recover the economy. And the economy last year, sorry, last month, the late rate of inflation in June was 1%. And this year, the economy of Venezuela is down to grow by something between 5 to 8%. To be able to recover that much, and then under those conditions, even though there's been a significant economic recovery, still is possible for the Chavistas you know, to defeat imperialism, to defeat the school that is an indication of their quality as political leadership, which I think is a matter. So, that's one aspect. And in terms of the success of US imperialism, I think it still is successful to some degree because we are disunited in Latin America. We need regional integration fast. The sooner the better, because the more together we are, as there was one moment during the first pink tide, no, it was not perfect, but it was much better. If we are together, then it's much more difficult for the United States to actually go for us. Now we have the, the, what is called the Troika, which is Cuba, Nicaragua, and Venezuela identified as the best ones at the vanguard. Therefore, we have, we, you know, they are in the front line and they receive the worst possible blows. Uh, when it comes, as a small footnote regarding Venezuela, when it comes to the Catholic Church, let me summarize in one point. It's totally reactionary. And I supported every single possibility, every single plan 
and every single effort to destabilize, to overthrow the government, and it's failed miserably every occasion. The population at large in, in Venezuela is very, very Catholic. But when it comes to their relationship with the Catholic Church, it's very tenuous. People are very ferociously independent, even though they're Catholic. Chavo was a Catholic. Maduro says a Catholic. So that's not the issue. And I think the Catholic Church used to have in 2002 some significant weight. It doesn't have that anymore. And now it plays second fiddle at best, and it's much more careful than it used to be. But we will continue fighting, and I think we will continue to win, provided that, you know, these very capable, impressive political leadership, such as the FSLN, such as the Cuban Communist Party, and such as the PSUV, continue to be in the, in the leadership of this country. Long live that. Thank you.